Okay, so uh, we're carrying on from where we left off in the last lecture, which was looking at some examples of code that's basically using things like operator U, operator delete, place menu, and so on. And the example that we're going to consider here is something similar to the std vector class in the standard library. Uh, the particular class template that we're dealing with is called vac, just to distinguish it from the standard library because the functionality is not quite the same. Uh, essentially, it provides a one-dimensional dynamically resizable array. So you can basically grow the size of the array at runtime, and as the container is being used, it can grow and uh, grow appropriately. Uh, it's a templated, a templated class, and it's templated on a type parameter t, which is the type of the elements that you put in the container. And we're going to be using operator new to allocate the storage that these elements are going to be placed in. So again, it, this is uh, similar to the std vector class. It's much simplified, though. Um, it, you can't specify an allocator. In case you might not be aware, the std vector class has a parameter that has a default that a lot of the time people just let it default, but you can actually override the allocator that's used by default and specify a custom one. We're not going to try to provide such functionality. We're not going to provide iterators like const iterator and iterator types. And also, we're not going to try to provide a strong exception safety guarantees. So some of the uh, functionality in this the std vector uh, class is such that if, if the uh, operation you're performing fails due to an exception being thrown, for example, that it provides what's called the strong exception safety guarantee, which basically it's like a, if you're familiar with databases, like a transaction type thing. Like it's an atomic operation. Either you do the operation, succeed, or it's as if nothing happened. Um, but that requires more work, because if things go wrong, you have to back out any state that you've changed. So we're not going to worry about any of that. So it's essentially a very stripped down version of std, uh, a std vector from the standard library. So the picture that goes with this is what's shown here. So we've seen a picture similar to this, I think, back in the maybe second or third lecture in the course. Uh, so this is our, our vector type called vac. It's templated on a, a, te a type of the element that's going to be put into the container. And it has some array which has been allocated. It's going to be allocated, for example, using operator new to hold the actual element data. And we have a pointer to the start of the allocated memory. So here we have our allocated memory. Um, we have a pointer to the end of the allocated memory, or like one past the end, which is this element it would be here if there was one, which there's not. And then we have a pointer to one past the last valid element in the array, or last in use slot in the array, which is this one here. So in this particular example, the elements that are shown in white are elements that are actually in the container. So there's actually n elements in the container. The ones that are shaded, there's basically nothing there. It's, it's yet to have any objects actually constructed in that area of memory. So if we look at the code example, this is spread across a number of slides. Um, the, the main kind of API specification appears on this slide. So we have our vec class, and it takes a single template parameter, again, which is the type of the elements in the container. Uh, the first thing that we have here is a default constructor. Uh, because the default constructor doesn't need to allocate memory, the behavior that's expected or that's provided in terms of the API it provides is it just creates an empty container. So there's not any need to allocate memory unless you wanted to pre-allocate, and this is just going to say I'm not going to pre-allocate memory before I need it. Uh, so for this reason, it can make a no exception guarantee, no accept guarantee. It doesn't need to ever throw an exception because it doesn't do anything it would ever throw. And it just sets all three pointers, start, finish, and end, to be null pointers. So this is basically saying there's no memory allocated. And because there's no memory allocated, sort of implied in that is there's nothing in the container because there's nowhere that it could be placed in the first place. Uh, then the next uh, function that we have here, we have another constructor. This is the copy constructor. Uh, because it's non-trivial, it's more than just a one-liner. It appears on a subsequent slide. We'll look at this later. Uh, we have the move constructor, which also appears on a subsequent slide. We'll look at that later. And then we have a, a destructor for the class, which comes later. Uh, we have an assignment, op copy assignment operator, move assignment operator, which also appear later, and some other constructors. You have a constructor that essentially takes a size. And what this will do is it will create a vector that has size elements in it that are all default constructed. And, it's, and then uh, this constructor here, it takes a, a count n and then a value. And what it will do is it'll create a container that has n elements, which are all initialized to value. And then we have some simple one-liners here. We have a capacity, which basically provides the amount of storage that's been allocated for the container, like the maximum number of elements that you could hold in the container without having to reallocate the underlying memory that's used to store those elements. So this is just going to be the difference between end and start. If we take the difference between two pointers, it just gives the number of elements between them, which is what we want here. Then we have a size member function. This just gives the number of elements in the container. So this is just the difference between finish and start. Again, finish was a pointer that's one past the last element that's actually sitting in the container that's valid. So if we take the difference between these, this just gives the number of elements that are actually stored in the container currently. 
Um, then we provide an overloaded uh, subscripting operator. It's overloaded because we have a, a const overload here, a const member function, and then a non-const version, which is the one that comes first. And they just take, of course, an array index, which is an integer, and it returns a, a reference to that element. Uh, start i is going to be the a reference, basically the i-th element in the, the underlying array. And then we have another member function, which is overloaded, called back, which has a const version and a non-const version, which appears first. And it just, both of them have the same code. Basically, they're just returning a reference to the the, uh, the very last element in the container. So because finish points one past the end, if you want to get to the last valid element, it would be index minus one from finish. So this is why we're returning finish minus one. Um, then we have pushback, which basically adds an element onto the, the end of the list of elements in the container, sticks it at the end of the array, and popback, which removes that element, and then clear, which essentially clears out the contents of the container so it's empty. And again, the ones that don't have implementations, we'll look at them later. The, the, the implementation we're going to look at is complete. So all the member functions that don't have their definitions on the slide, they do appear later on the subsequent slides. And then of course, there's the, the data members here, start, finish, and end. And also we have one private member as well called grow. And the intention behind this is this is this is the thing that does the reallocation. When you have something like std vector, which is basically what we have here, um, if the array gets too big, you keep adding elements to it, eventually you run out of space and you need to grow with the underlying vector that's used to hold the data. And this is the function that does that. And it takes a single parameter, which what, what's the new size that you want for the underlying array? What do you want to grow it to? Um, so we'll look at this function as well. And it's been made private because it's not really, it's not really part of the public interface. It's an implementation detail, so we don't want other people calling it directly. Any questions about any of the sort of the semantics, the behavior in terms of the API for the class? Okay, so let's keep going then. Um, so I'll just go through the functions in the order that they appear here just so that I don't miss anything. So the first function that we have here, this is a copy constructor. We have a, an L value reference parameter that we're constructing from. Um, so what we need to do here, we have a, another vector that we want to construct from. So we're gonna be copying from this other vector that's literally called other. So the first thing that we're gonna to need to do is we're gonna to need to allocate some storage to hold the elements that we're going to be copying. So, and the number of elements that we need to allocate, the, we need to allocate uh, other, other dot size elements, like basically the number of elements in the other thing that we're copying from, we need the space for that many elements. And each one of them is obviously size of T. So the number of bytes we need in total is just the product of these two things. So we're gonna allocate that much memory with operator new. And because operator new returns a void star, we have to cast this to a T star because you, you can always convert things to a void star, go from a non-generic pointer to a generic pointer, that's fine. But going the other way, you need a cast because it's a more dangerous thing to do. So we need this cast here. And this becomes this, the pointer that we put this into the pointer, which start, which represents the start of allocated memory. Um, then we update the end pointer or initialize the end pointer, which is basically one past the end of allocated storage, which, just, which is just going to be the start plus the number of elements in the array that we've allocated. So this will be path pointing one past the end. So now we've got the memory allocated. Now we actually need to put the data into that allocated memory. So to do this, we're gonna use the uninitialized copy function. And basically the first two iterator, the first two arguments here are iterators which are specifying a range to copy from. So we're copying from the beginning of the other container to the, the, the end, the last valid element in the array essentially in the other container. And we're copying to as the destination, the buffer that we just allocated. And the return value of this function is just where the, the sort of the, the destination point or the place that you're copying to where it's left after you're done iterating. It's gonna be one past the, the last valid element in the container we're creating. Therefore, we, we're using this to initialize finish because it has the value that we want. Um, we have to put this inside of a try block though because um, this operation could throw an exception. When we're constructing these objects, we're doing basically copy construction to, to copy these objects. And this could throw an exception. And if it throws an exception, if we didn't do something special, we would leak this memory that's allocated up above here because we, if this froze and we didn't have it inside a try block and catch the exception, we're gonna get violently ripped out of this function. We, we don't finish executing the code in it, which means there's this pointer here is just gonna leak. It will never get deallocated. So because of this, we have to put this uh, thing that could, that could fail due to an exception being thrown inside of a try block and then we catch all exceptions using dot, dot, dot. This will catch anything that's thrown. And if an exception is thrown, what we do is we then uh, call operator delete to d delete the pointer, like free the memory that we allocated up above here. Because if we're returning due to an exception being thrown, this object's never getting constructed. Therefore, we need to free any resources associated with it. So we call operator delete here, and then we explicitly re-throw the exception. Um, 
Uh, then if we go on to the move constructor, this is the next thing that we have here. This is a move constructor because we have an R value reference here. This is a very trivial function, relatively speaking, compared to the copy constructor. Um, all we're doing here effectively is we're taking the other object, the one that's the source for our move, and we're just nulling out all the pointers, just basically emptying the container. And then what we're doing, we're hijacking all the pointers from the other container and basically just copying into this container. So we're like ripping the guts out of the other container we're copying from, dropping that into our current container, and then setting all the other ones to null. So the effect that this will have, this move operation will have, is after it's done, the other container, the, the one that's being used for the source for the move, it will be empty, uh, which, was a, is, which is a legitimate state to have the container in. The move just has to leave things in a, in a sane state, but we can choose whatever is most convenient for us. In this case, the most convenient thing is just leave it empty. And then we have a destructor here. The, what the destructor does is it calls clear, and I think uh, we'll look at clear a little bit later. I think we haven't seen this yet. But what clear does is it just empties out all the elements in the container, leaving the container empty. And then we invoke operator delete. Because like after everything has been uh, cleared out in the container, this would basically invoke any destructors for elements in the container. But it doesn't free the underlying memory. So we still need to free the memory. So we call operator delete to invoke uh, or to uh, release the point, the chunk of memory that's pointed to by start that we allocated when we constructed the object in the first place. So any questions about any of this code on this slide? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, in the copy constructor, um, so if an error occurs partway through copying, like let's say we have copied some things over, but then there, there is an error that occurs, mm -hmm. um, we're then freeing the memory, but where here have we uh, deconstructed the things that okay, this, up that point? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. This is done by uninitialized copy. So like uninitialized copy, this is the reason why you might want to use some of these uninitialized, like these functions that have the word uninitialized in their name. Because if, if they didn't do this cleanup, the functions are kind of trivial. Like they don't really need to do too much. You just do a loop and pray to God that nothing goes wrong. But this thing does more than just pray to God that nothing goes wrong. If it, something goes wrong and an exception is thrown, it catches it internally inside this function, cleans up, destroys the things that were done. Like in other words, if you get partway through, some things are constructed, but some things aren't, and then it fails. It will destroy the things that were constructed so that when you come out of this function, you're guaranteed that there's nothing that's going to be leaked. Um, so this is the reason why we're using these, uh, these uninitialized copy, uninitialized move, and so on, because they have this extra behavior. Um, otherwise, if we didn't do that, if we just did kind of a more direct copy, then we would have to put in extra logic to catch exceptions and then do additional cleanup as well. But that this is the reason, one of the big benefits of these functions that we're using here, uninitialized copy, uninitialized uninitialized copy move and so on. Any other questions? Okay, let's keep going then. So on to the next slide here. So here we have, I guess, the uh, copy assignment operator is the next function that appears. Um, so the very first thing we do is we check for self-assignment uh, because if, if you, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to think of on your own, but if you didn't do a check for self-assignment and just always blindly let it execute the same code, it's going to really butcher the, the state of the container. So in this case, we definitely need to check for self-assignment. And if it is self-assignment, we simply don't need to do anything. So we can skip over all this code and just return a reference to star this. Uh, but in the case that it isn't self-assignment, then we actually, actually, actually need to do something to assign things. So what we do here is we first of all clear out the current object, which is the one that we're assigning to. Because if we're going to assign to it, we're going to overwrite its value. So let's empty out all the objects that are currently there first. So once we hit this line here, we're guaranteed that the object that we're operating on, the one that's the, the destination for the assignment, is now empty. Uh, so we don't have to worry about any complications that would be caused by the container not being empty. Um, then we check to make sure that the array that we have, the, the array that's been, uh, the size of the array that we're copying from, so this is like how many elements we have to copy, we check to make sure that it's not going to exceed the size of our array that we're copying into, right? Because we're going to be copying from from this other vector, but the other vector might have a much larger chunk of memory allocated for its array. So maybe all the elements when we try to copy them, there's not enough space in our own array in, in the, this, the destination we're copying into. So here we're checking to make sure there's enough space. If there isn't, then we call this, this private member function that we looked at before grow, which simply will uh, grow the size of the, the array for the current object to be equal to other size. So it basically will allocate just enough space in, in our array that we can copy the stuff from the other vector into this new array that we've allocated. And then lastly, we're going to do an uninitialized copy to actually copy from the other other object, you know, basically other.start to other.finish denote the range of elements in the other container we need to copy from. And we're going to copy them to the chunk of memory in the container we're copying into, like the current or the, the current vector object. 
um, in, into its allocated storage, which starts at start underscore. And then, of course, we have to return a reference to this because this is what assignment operators do. They always return a reference to the, the object that you're operating on, just as a convention. Any questions with that function? Okay, so then we go on to the, the move. Again, moves, you can see like the pattern. Like when you get into more complicated data structures, moves have much, are much more lightweight. There's less that they need to do. There's lots of things that you can do when, when you are allowed to completely mutilate the thing that you're propagating the value from. So in this case, we again, we have a, a, move, con, a move assignment operator. I don't know if I said move constructor. If I did, I meant move assignment operator. Um, and other is the object that we're, it's the source for the, the move operation. So we check, well, you don't really need to check for self-assignment. I, I would argue this is not really needed. Um, I would probably be more inclined just to put an assert in here because any reasonable code is probably not going to do self-assignment. In the case of a move, you'd have to write really kind of highly questionable code. But anyway, this actually checks it, but it's probably good to have an assertion in any case. Um, so the very first thing we do is if we actually need to do work is we're going to clear out the container that we're moving into just to make sure that it's in an empty state to begin with. Um, then we we free the memory associated with the, the current object because we're basically going to overwrite all the stuff in the current container. So let's just get rid of everything, including de deleting, actually deallocating the buffer that's been allocated for the array data. And then what we do is we copy the, the start, finish, and end pointers from the other object, the one that we're moving from, into the current object. And then we set start, finish, and end all to null pointers in the other object. So the end effect, again, of doing a move is similar to what we have in the case of move construction. We're going to leave the moved from object empty. It's going to be an empty container. So again, with a move, you always want to leave things in a valid state. But the thing is, you can leave it in any valid state. So pick one that's convenient for an efficient implementation. In this case, the convenient thing is just choose it to be empty. So that's what we do here. And then we return, again, a reference to star this. Any questions? OK, the next. Uh, Next bunch of functions. So here we have some more constructors. This is a constructor that takes a size. So what this is going to do, again, it's going to create a container that has n elements in it, and they're all default constructed. So maybe not surprisingly, the kind of the key function we're going to be calling here is uninitialized default construct. So this is going to basically construct, default construct a bunch of elements. Uh, but the first thing we need to do is we need to have somewhere that we can construct those elements into. We need some memory that's allocated. So the first thing we're going to do is use operator new to allocate some memory. The amount of memory we need is enough to store n elements, so we're going to need n times size of t bytes. So this is how much we're requesting to be allocated. Again, we need a static cast because the return type of operator new is void star, so we need to, to cast it to a specific like non-generic pointer type t star. And we assign that to our start pointer, which is the start of allocated memory. And then we initialize the end pointer to start plus n, which is going to be one past the end of the allocated memory. And then we have to actually do the construction. And again, for similar reasons as in some of the other code we looked at a little bit earlier, we need to put this inside of a try block because when we're doing these default construction operations, they can throw, something might go wrong. And if that happens, if we didn't catch the exception, if we just let it propagate out right away without doing anything, uh, what's going to happen is that we're going to leak the memory that was allocated up here because there wouldn't be anything to clean it up because um, because an exception was thrown. So what we do is we, we put wrap this in a try block, this default construct n. Um, and basically all this is going to do is just starting at the pointer that's or iterator that's denoted by start here, we're going to default construct n elements, starting at start and then in the, the, the consecutive addresses after that. And if this fails, then we, we catch an, the exception that's thrown. We do catch dot, 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 which will catch anything. And then we take the pointer up above and we free it. And then we rethrow the exception. Uh, if things didn't go wrong, then basically we just come down to the end here and we set our, our the finish pointer to be the end. Because essentially what we've done is we've allocated just enough space for the elements that we're going to put into it. Therefore, when all is said and done, the, the whole array is going to be full. So therefore, finish will be equal to end. This would correspond to a, the array being exactly full, having the size equal to the capacity. And then if we look at the, the last function on this particular slide, we have another constructor. This one takes a a size, which is, or, which is a number of elements that we want to put in the container, and then a value to initialize them to. So we'll create a container with n elements, each initialized to the value denoted by value here. So again, the first thing we're going to need to do is allocate some memory to hold the data that we're going to put into the container, the element data. And we need to allocate uh, n times size of t, because the number of elements we want in the container is n. And then the the end pointer is going to be just updated to be start plus end. This will point one past the end of the allocated storage. 
And then we need to fill in the allocated storage by constructing objects into it. So we're going to use a uninitialized fill n, which basically starts at this address here and then kind of goes to consecutive addresses after it, repeating n times, copying this value into the, the elements, you know, start and start plus one, start plus two, and so on until you reach n. Um, again, this might throw an exception. If it throws an exception, we want to catch it because if we didn't catch it, what would happen is this memory that was allocated above here would be leaked because we'd be violently ripped out of this function and there would be no one, no one left to free this pointer here. Uh, so we catch the exception, uh, free the pointer, and then rethrow the exception. Um, otherwise, if we don't go into the exception case, if we don't actually throw and this is successful, we just come down here and we initialize finish to end, meaning that the all of the elements in the array are actually being used for valid data, which is the case, because we only allocated enough storage here for the number of elements that we're going to put into the container. We didn't over allocate. Any questions with anything on this slide? Okay. Uh, so slide number five. Um, can't remember if there's a slide after this. At least we're getting closer to the end anyway. So the next uh, member function is pushback. So this just does a similar thing with std vector. Basically, a lot of this interface is just kind of copied from std vector. So this is just going to take the value specified here and stick it at the end, append it to the end of the array that's currently there. So the first thing we want to make sure is that we're not going to go past the end of the array. So we check to see if finish is equal to end. If these pointers are equal, this would correspond to all of the slots in the array that are allocated are being used for data. So in other words, the, the size and capacity are equal. So in this case, we would have to make the, like reallocate, make the array larger so that we have space to accommodate the new element that we're adding. So the, what we do for this is we call this grow function and we specify, and the particular pattern that's being followed here is if you run out of space in the array, we double it. And every time we reallocate, we're gonna double it. Um, the reason for not wanting to do something like the, making the capacity grow by a fixed constant, like an additive constant, if you do this, then you can, you can show that the, the amortized complexity of pushback is not going to be constant time, amortized constant time. Um, by, by growing it by, say, a factor of two, you can show that overall, over many, many calls, the, on average, if you average them all together, in other words, the amortized cost is going to be constant time for this operation. So this is the reason why you, you, you use a multiplicative factor to grow the array by. It has advantages in terms of efficiency. Um, anyway, if, if it turns out that we have space in the array, then we don't go into this if. Uh, in either case, what we end up doing in the end is we have to fill in the, the additional slot. Uh, so we're going to use uninitialized fill n, which is going to copy this value, the one that we're trying to push back up here. It's going to start at finish and keep propagating this value into the container n times, but n, n is one, so it's just going to do it once. So basically do one copy. And the return value of this is just uh, one past the end of where we copy to, which is what we want our finish pointer to be. So we just initialize finish to do that. Uh, then if we go on to the next function, pop back, this just removes the last element from the end of the array. So what we do is we back up our finish pointer by one. So finish is pointing one past the last valid element. So if we want one less element, we have to decrement this pointer by one. And then we have to actually destroy the object that was that finish is pointing to. Because so when we back it up, it's now actually pointing to a valid element, which is the element we want to get rid of. But we need to invoke the destructor to actually get rid of it. Otherwise, we're going to possibly leak resources that that object actually holds. So we call destroy out to do that, which is just, this is a very simple function. It's basically just directly invoking the destructor for this, the, of the object that this pointer points to. And then if we look at the last function on this slide here, clear, so basically what this does is it just empties out the container and leaves it in a state where there's no element stored in it. So what we do first of all is check to make sure the size is, the size is non-zero. In other words, are there actually elements in the container? Because if there aren't, I don't need to do anything. Um, if there are elements in the container, then what I do is I loop over all the elements in the container calling the destructor to destroy them all. And then I set the finish pointer, which is pointing one past the last valid element to the start of the allocated storage, which would correspond to the container being empty, uh, zero elements. Any questions? Okay, so if we go to the, okay, so this is a, the last slide in this example. So the last function we need to talk about, I think is probably the longest one in terms of lines of code, but still not too long. Um, this is the grow function. So this is a private member function. This is invoked any time that the, 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 uh, the vector class needs to do reallocation to increase the size of the underlying array that's being used to store the element data. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're gonna use operator new to allocate a new chunk of memory and the size of the chunk of memory we want to allocate is going to be um, n, this value here, times size of t, because the, the semantics of this function is it's going to allocate an array which is big enough for n elements, where n is this parameter that's being passed in. So we allocate our, this new chunk of storage, and 
And by the way, for example, it, we had a bunch of operators used in, in some of the other earlier code. Like if this throws, we don't have to worry about trying to catch anything because if this throws, there's nothing to clean up. So we just let it propagate out of the function. The reason why we need to do like a try block down here and like a similar kind of comment applies to some of the earlier code. The reason why we didn't wrap the call to operator new inside a try block is that it was always like the very first thing we were doing. So there was there's no state that needs to be undone, like no changes that need to be undone or cleaned up if, if things fail. Um, but operator new, operator new itself, uh, because of the way we're using it here, we're not using placement. Like we're not, we're using an allocating version of operator new. So this could throw, it could throw a bad alloc. Anyway, uh, so we allocate the memory and then we assign this to new start. This is not the, the data member. This is just a local variable to function. Because we can't assign it to start. Otherwise we would lose all the stuff that's currently stored there and have no way to destroy it. Um, Anyway, so the next thing we do is we record the, the current size of the container so that we know how many elements are there after we start maybe changing some of the other state in the container. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to take all the elements um, that are in our, our current array and we're going to move them into the new array that we've allocated. We're going to use a move rather than a copy because a move will probably be more efficient for most types, like for most types that capital T could be um, our, our template parameter here. So we're going to move the, the range from start to finish. So all the elements that are currently in the container, we're going to move them all to this new chunk of memory that we have allocated called new start. And then of course, this could throw. Is the, usually in practice, it won't, because usually we try to write move constructors in a way that they won't throw. Um, and but, but they could throw. So because of this, we want to be careful. So we actually catch any exceptions that are thrown. And if any exceptions are thrown, what we do is we deallocate this memory that was allocated up here that's pointed to by new start, just so that we don't leak it. And then we rethrow the exception. Um, if this succeeds, then essentially what we have here is we've, we've propagated all the data from our old array into the new array. So now what we want to do is we want to make sure that we delete the old array, like free the storage for the old array. Otherwise, we'll leak it. So we call delete on that. And then we then we initialize, update our start, finish, and end pointer. So start is going to be pointing to the new chunk of memory we've allocated, new start. Finish will be pointing just past the end of that allocated storage, which will be new start, plus whatever the old size was, which is essentially what the new size is going to be as well initially. And then we, the end pointer is going to be just new start plus end. This will be one past the end of the allocated storage. So that brings us to the end of this example. Any questions about this slide? Okay, so that's uh, the end of this material. Um, what we're gonna do at this point is jump to a discussion about uh, intrusive containers. So like more memory allocation stuff, but this is a separate section, I think of the lecture slides, or at least it's a few slides later, it might be in a completely different section. Again, but the slide number should match the ones that you have. So what I want to talk about here are what are called intrusive containers. Containers can either be intrusive or non-intrusive. And so far, all the containers we've been talking about are what are called non-intrusive containers. They're, they're not intrusive in the sense that when you're using them, their kind of inner workings don't intrude into your life as a user of that class. Like you, it basically hides a lot of implement, hides the implementation details from you. Um, so what, what makes an, a container intrusive is that if a container is intrusive, in order to use it, um, there's often some help that's required by the container from the person using the container. There's something special you need to do. It might involve, for example, adding extra data members to your class because the cla this class that you're using is going to need them. So it basically intrudes into your life and be, you're, you're, it somehow leaks in some way implementation details into your code. Um, with an intrusive container, it, it directly places uh, objects into the container, it doesn't copy them. If you look at something like std vector or the, or the vec class we just finished talking about, they have the property that you never really put your object in the container. Like you, you call pushback, for example, and you provide it with an object that you want to go into the container, but it, it doesn't actually put that object in the container. What it does is it takes the object that you're passing to that function and puts a copy of it in the container. This is an important distinction to make. With non-intrusive containers like std vector and the vec class we just talked about, you never actually put any of your objects in the container. What you do is you provide something you want in the container and it will copy it or move it into the container. But it never actually puts your object directly into the container. And this raises issues like because non-intrusive containers have to put things into the container by propagating the value, either by copy or move, this introduces overhead because you always have to copy, move, copy, move. To, to put stuff in the container, which is maybe not desirable. Um, I think I'll skip over this bullet. Um, in the intrusive container, another important property of intrusive containers is they don't own the elements that they store. In, in contrast to non-intrusive containers, where non-intrusive containers do own the elements that they store. And what I mean by ownership, um, 
is this is a really important notion in terms of like memory management or in more general in terms of resource management. Um, when you have code that's allocating resources, and maybe the most common one is memory, and that's the one that's most relevant to what we're talking about here. Um, when you're allocating memory, there, there needs to be someone that's responsible for freeing that memory when you're done with it. And, and the basic idea is that some part of the code is going to be designated or deemed to be the owner, the person who's responsible for cleaning up that memory that when it, when it reaches the end of its need, like when all the objects that are stored in it reach the end of their lifetime and you don't need that memory anymore, the owner is the one that's responsible for cleaning that memory up. So what I mean by intrusive containers don't own the elements they store is that um, the container never needs to worry, the code in the container never needs to worry about allocating memory, freeing memory, because it doesn't actually own the memory that is associated with the container. Someone else has to allocate it long before the function is ever in, the functions for that container class are ever invoked in the first place. Um, because of this, the, the lifetime of the stored objects are not bound um, bound to or managed by the container. So what I mean by this is because the container doesn't allocate the storage to hold the objects that are in the container, it's allocated by someone that, that's calling the code for the container, the person who's responsible for cleaning up that memory is going to be someone external to the container. And because of this, the lifetime of the objects that are stored in the container, they can outlive the container because they're, they're not stored in memory that's owned by the container. Therefore, when the container object is destroyed, because the container doesn't own that memory, it's not gonna to try to clean anything up. It just, it, it just doesn't do anything. And that memory is left allocated. Any objects are still in that memory. They're not destroyed. They just live on. Uh, so this allows you to have more flexibility when you're using intrusive containers that, that objects can outlive the container that they're stored in. Because they, 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 they exist before you, they may exist before the container exists in the first place. And more importantly, they can outlive the container as well. Um, you can also store elements in multiple intrusive containers at the same time. With non-intrusive containers, this is not possible because you never put the object in the container in the first place. Like it's important to understand that with non-intrusive containers like std vector, you're only ever putting copies of your data into the container. You never actually put any of your objects directly in the container. So because of this, it's impossible to put your objects in multiple containers because it's never really putting your object in the container in the first place, it's putting copies of them. So this makes it impossible to put it in multiple containers because in, in theory, you're not really even putting it in one container in the first place, it's copies. Um, but intrusive containers that can allow for um, objects, being, uh, objects being placed in multiple containers at the same time. And for some more complicated sorts of data structures, this becomes really critical. Like you really need to be able to put things into multiple containers at the same time. And intrusive containers, because of the fact that they effectively, the way they achieve some of the functionality that's described here is that they essentially make some of their implementation noticeable to the external world. They basically kind of leak details of their implementation to the outside world and kind of ram it down the throat of the code that's using them. Uh, because of this, there's, there tends to be more coupling between the code that implements the container and the person using it. In the ideal world, you like things to be kind of completely decoupled, so there's no implementation details in the user code. That that's or any there's no knowledge of implementation details in the container that, in the code that's using the container, uh, but because of the fact that intrusive containers typically in some shape or form kind of leak some of their implementation details to the external world, um, you can get more coupling between the code for the container and the code that's using it, which is kind of undesirable. It's one of the things in you know software engineering you strive to avoid, but sometimes it is unavoidable because you need for other reasons you might need to use an intrusive container. Um, some of the shortcomings of non-intrusive containers, so these are things, things like std vector, everything that we've talked about so far in the course, essentially, the more basic sort of containers. Objects can only be put into one container for the reasons I described before. Um, you only store copies of objects in containers, not the actual objects themselves. So this implies you have to put them there by copying or moving. This is overhead. You need to do copy constructors, move constructors, and so on. Um, what happens when you have objects that can't be copied and can't be moved? Well, this becomes very problematic if you want to put sub some objects like this in a non-intrusive container, because how do you put them in the container? You put them in the container by copying or moving, typically. Um, well, you can't do this because the object can't be copied or moved. So the only option this really leaves you with is if there's a constructor the container provides that allows you to directly construct an object in some magic way inside the container directly. And some containers do this. But if it doesn't do this, you have no way to put such an object in the container because you would have to copy it or move it to get it in. Uh, so this becomes a problem. Um, well, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about derivation and inheritance, so I'll just skip over the last bullet. We don't really need inheritance for this course, at least not, not in any kind of more sophisticated level. So when you mentioned the magic like, yep. structure, that's like in place back? Is that what it means, vector? 
Yeah, in, yeah, in place that. So like if any of you have been using like using some of the containers from the standard library, you see this function called in place back rather than well, yeah, like it push back. The difference between like push back basically puts the object in well, push back does have overloads that take R value references, which do a move. Uh, but basically you're either doing a copy or a move if you're using push back. But if you use in place back, what it does is the parameters for in place back are not the object you want to put in the container. What they are are constructor parameters, and what it does is it directly constructs that object in the container. So, but that would be kind of your only option if you have like a, if you're using a container and you have objects that you want to put into it that aren't copyable or movable, the only way that you could do this would be using something kind of similar in functionality to in place back, because that would actually construct the object directly in the container. Yeah. So next I'd like to talk about the advantages of intrusive containers. So to begin with, uh, with intrusive containers, the same object can be placed in multiple intrusive containers at the same time. This is in contrast to non-intrusive containers where an object can only be placed in one container at a time. Intrusive containers also don't invoke memory management operations since they don't actually own the elements that they store. So this leads to a number of benefits. For example, the complexity of inserting and removing elements in intrusive containers can be more predictable since there's no memory allocation involved. And memory allocation can introduce, make things a little bit less predictable because for example, you might need to go out to the operating system to request more memory uh, to be added to your process. Another advantage of intrusive containers is that they tend to allow stronger complexity guarantees to be made. And the reason for this is that generally when you're dealing with containers, Containers spend a fair amount of time either doing operations that pertain to memory allocation or pertain to copying or moving to propagate the value from outside of a container into the container. In the case of intrusive containers, though, these operations don't need to be performed because intrusive containers don't deal with memory allocation and also they directly put objects in the container. So there's no need to copy or move objects or values from outside the container into the container. And because these operations are not necessary, this allows for the operations that are provided by the intrusive container to have lower complexity, allowing for longer, uh, stronger complexity guarantees to be made. Intrusive containers also make better exception safety guarantees since they don't need to make a copy of the elements that are placed in the container. Uh, because of the fact that they don't need to do this copying to propagate the value of a, an object uh, into a container, uh, via, for example, a copy constructor, a move constructor, this makes it easier to make strong, uh, better uh, exception safety guarantees because generally speaking, you're going to have fewer possibilities that exceptions can be thrown in the first place, uh, simply because some of the operations that might throw exceptions are not being performed in the case of an intrusive container. Another common operation to want to do when you have containers, often you're using iterators, and you may have a pointer or a reference to an element inside the container and you want to get an iterator that corresponds to that, that data that's being referenced or pointed to by a pointer. And for intrusive containers, this can be done easily in constant time. Uh, but in the case of non-intrusive containers, typically this is, just takes a linear, is a linear time operation. Essentially you have to iterate through the elements in the container until you finally hit an element that has the particular address that corresponds to the pointer or reference that you have. Of course, before we get all excited here and start saying, oh, intrusive containers, they have so many advantages, let's just use intrusive containers everywhere. Unfortunately, there are a lot of disadvantages to using intrusive containers and the list is quite long. Um, so there are a lot of issues with respect to using intrusive containers. So typically we only use them when we really need to use them, when there's a compelling argument in favor of them. Um, anyway, there's quite a few disadvantages, so let's go through each of these. So, uh, well, typically when you're using intrusive containers, because they, their implementation details to a certain extent leak out to the, the code that's actually using the container, this sometimes results in changes being necessary to the, the user's code, the code that's using the container. For example, it's not uncommon for the user of the container to need to add additional data members to classes and so on, basically changing some of the layout of some of the, the classes that are used in order to allow the intrusive containers to be used. And because intrusive containers expose some of the implementation details of the container to the user, this causes more coupling between the, the container type that's being used and the user's code, which is generally undesirable. 
And also, since some implementation details are exposed by the container, this makes it easier to break some of the invariants of the container. For example, suppose that you're using some sort of map, like a, a, an intrusive container which implements a map. A map has a key. Basically, it stores uh, key value pairs. And if the uh, container is intrusive, it's quite possible that the user of the container has direct access to the key, that they could actually go in and change the key. But if the user starts changing the key and, and doesn't tell the container that the key has been changed, this can lead to invariants of the container being broken. For example, one of the invariants of a map is all the elements in the container are sorted with respect to the key. Except, But if you go and start changing the key value behind the back of the container, if the user of the container changes the key, this is going to cause the elements to no longer be sorted in the appropriate order that's uh, expected by the container, uh, thus breaking one of the invariants of the container. Also, it's not uncommon for the user of the container to have direct access to some of the pointers that are used to hold, you know, basically manage the container and hold some of the parts of the container together. For example, in the case of doubly linked list, you, you may have direct access to the next and previous pointers as a user of the container. Therefore, you could directly go in and mangle these pointers and, and mess up some of the invariants of the container in this way. Another disadvantage of intrusive containers is that the user has to assume responsibility for memory management since the container doesn't do this. And this makes things more complicated for the user because generally a lot of the issues revolving around memory management are kind of ugly and they require about a, a little bit of care to do, handle properly. Uh, so essentially the container code becomes somewhat simpler because it doesn't have to deal with these issues, but these issues don't go away. They just get pushed on to the user to deal with. Another disadvantage of intrusive containers is that the user of the container must manage the lifetime of the objects placed in the container independent from the lifetime of the container itself, and this can be error prone. For example, when destroying a container before destroying all of the objects in the container, one has to be very careful not to lose track of the objects that were stored in the container because the act of destroying the container doesn't destroy the objects that were stored in the container. And if one loses track of those objects, they'll probably not be destroyed later on, and then any resources that are associated with those objects will be leaked. Also, we have to be very careful not to destroy an object while it's still in the container, because this is likely to have very disastrous consequences, because the objects themselves that we're storing in the container maintain some of the critical state that's associated with the container. And if we just go and delete an object while it's in the container, this will likely lead to problems like dangling references, dangling pointers, and so on. And the list goes on. There's yet more disadvantages to intrusive containers. Another disadvantage of intrusive containers is that typically the containers themselves aren't copyable. Uh, sometimes they're not movable as well. And the main reason for this is that Typically copying and, and possibly moving as well may require memory allocation and deallocation type operations. And because intrusive containers don't do memory allocation, uh, this causes problems with respect to copyability and movability of classes. Um, copyability is more problematic uh, because typically when you, when you want to copy objects, you need to have somewhere to copy the data to, and therefore you're going to need to allocate memory. In the case of moving, sometimes we can get away without having to do memory allocation and deallocation, um, maybe, maybe by swapping the contents of the two containers, for example, to perform the move. Um, but typically, we also want to do some memory deallocation when we're doing moves as well, and this can be problematic. So one other disadvantage of intrusive containers is that analyzing the thread safety of programs that use intrusive containers can often be more challenging. And basically what the issue is, is the following. In the case of non-intrusive containers, because the implementation details are, are all hidden inside the container, basically the only way that the user can access the data in the container is through the interface that the container class provides. So it's easier for the container class to make guarantees about thread safety because it can ensure that everyone's going through the interface of the class who accesses the data internal to the container and the container can provide the necessary synchronization you know, using mutexes, other things to avoid data races. 
On the other hand, in the case of intrusive containers, because some of the implementation details are typically leaked out to the user, so the user will often have access, direct access to some of the internals of the container, this means that the user can directly access container internals without ever actually going through the interface of the container. So without the container ever knowing, it's possible for users outside the container to access the internals of the container. And because the container doesn't know about this, it can't do proper synchronization and there's more chance that there could be data races and so on. Before we can proceed further, we have to take a slight detour and talk about a language feature of C++ known as pointers to members. This is a rather esoteric feature of the language, but nevertheless, it's quite useful for intrusive containers, which is why we need to talk about it. So a pointer to member provides a way to reference or name a particular non-static member of a class that's independent of any class object instance. Uh, pointers to members can only be formed from non-static members of a class. And if we have a particular member that we want to get a pointer to member for, so for example, suppose we have a class T and there's a member M within that class and we want to get a pointer to member for that particular member, we just apply the address of operator to the expression for that member, t colon colon m. And this would give us an address, a pointer to the member for the specific member m in the class t. For pointers to members, the special value null putter is reserved to mean a pointer to member that doesn't refer to any member. So it's similar to a null, a null putter value for a regular pointer. It's a pointer that doesn't refer to any valid data in memory. So as a matter of syntax in the language, if we want to write a pointer to a member of the class T, this is written as T colon colon star. So in the language, basic types read from right to left. So star means pointer. So it's a pointer to a member of the class T. The pointer to member type embodies both the type of the class that the pointer to member is for, as well as the type of the member itself within the class. And this will become a little bit more clear when I go through some examples below. So I have some examples of pointer to member types. Uh, first, we have int widget colon colon star. So again, basic types in the language read from right to left. So star means pointer. So it's a pointer to a member of the widget class. And the type of that member is int. So it's, it's pointing to a data member of type int. Uh, this next one here, we have const int widget colon colon star. So again, reading from right to left, it's a pointer to a member of the widget class whose type is constant. So that, so that maybe I should say that more slowly, it's not the English word constant, but const space int is the type of the data member. And we can also have pointers to members for function members as well. So for example, this would correspond to this one here, this uh, type here would correspond to a pointer to a member of the gadget class that's a function that takes a single parameter, which is an int. It's a const member function, and it returns a float. So with pointers to members, a pointer to member is not associated with any class object instance. So you can't do anything useful with a pointer to member just by itself in isolation. You have to combine it with an object or a pointer to an object in order to be able to, to dereference it. So if we have an object, for example, an object X of type T, and we want to access one of the members of that object using the pointer to member, we use a syntax something like this, where we write the object and then dot star, and then the pointer to member. And what this will do is this will access the particular member that's named by this pointer to member in the object X. If instead of having an object, we have a pointer, so we have a pointer P, which points to an object of type T, we can use this sort of syntax here. Instead of using a dot star, we use the arrow star. And what this will do is we'll first dereference the pointer P to get to the actual object, and then it will dereference this pointer to member to access the particular member that this pointer to member names. And since we're running out of time, I better stop here for today.